man by the name of Rajan Mahadevan walked into a room with several Guinness Book of World Record adjudicators. Over the next four hours, Mahadevan will recite the first 31,000 digits of pi, which would secure his place in the 1984 Guinness Book of World Records. Mahadevan realized his gift for memory around the age of five when he stumbled into his parents' driveway during one of their parties. He found that he was able to remember all of the numbers off of each guest's license plate. Interestingly enough, if you were to meet Mahadevan, chances are he would have trouble remembering you, as he states his ability to recall faces is not nearly as good as his ability to recall information. For Mahadevan to complete his reciting of Pi, several cognitive acts are occurring within his brain. Welcome back for our AP Psychology review on Unit 5. Game time, baby. Pretty sweet new intro, pretty sweet new backdrop. This is a rudimentary green screen that I created off of a bunch of green pieces of paper taped to my wall. Pretty sweet, working out for us right now. Anyways, in this video review, we are going to be digging into the world of cognitive psychology and how our brain processes all the information it receives on a daily basis. In this video review, we will start off by talking about memory and remembering, and we'll move on to forgetting and false memories. From there, we'll step away from memory and look at other cognitive processes, such as thinking and problem solving. We'll then move on to intelligence and finish off with language. Each one of these cognitive processes allow us to process, remember, and deal with all the information the brain receives. Memory is going to be the presence of learning over time through the storage and retrieval of information. Scientists have constructed several models to explain how our memory works. However, no single model has been able to capture every aspect of human memory. One very influential model of memory is going to be the stage model of memory proposed by Richard Atkinson and Richard Schriffen. It is going to be a very useful tool in explaining how memory works. In this model, memory is going to be characterized into three distinct stages. We're going to have our sensory memory, our short-term memory, and our long-term memory. Before we get started talking about these three distinct stages of memory, it is important to understand a few basic processes of how our memory works. Encoding is going to be the process of transforming information into a form entered and retained by the memory systems. Storage is going to be our ability to retain information in our memory so it can be used at a later time. Retrieval is going to be us simply retrieving information from our memory so that we can become consciously aware of it. Our journey of memory is going to start with our sensory memory. Information coming in from the outside world is first going to be picked up by our sensory memory systems. Sensory memory is going to register all this information from the environment and hold it for a brief period of time. I am talking seconds here. Think about it, has something like this ever happened to you? You're sitting on the couch watching TV when someone asks you a question such as, hey, have you seen the car keys anywhere? Then you just respond with, what? But not a split second later, the question then registers into your brain before the person has to repeat themselves. You were able to process this information from your environment because your sensory memory was able to hold on to this information for that brief period of time. Our sensory memory is going to be where all of our sensory information is registered. As stated before, our sensory memory is going to have a very large capacity for storage. However, since it has such a large capacity for storage, its duration will suffer, lasting anywhere from about a third of a second to three seconds, depending on the sense. Sensory memory is gonna deal with all of our senses, but most of the sensory stimuli we take in on a daily basis is going to be either auditory or visual. Our audio or echoic memory is going to process sound and it stays in our sensory registry for roughly three seconds. Our visual or iconic sensory memory, this is going to process all incoming visual stimuli. This is going to last for roughly a third of a second. Visual stimuli is far more prominent than audio stimuli, explaining why our iconic memory is much more brief than our echoic memory. This idea of sensory memory was discovered in 1960 by psychologist George Sperling. Sperling would have subjects stare at a screen where letters were projected anywhere from a 20th of a second to one second. After letters were projected, a specific tone would sound, indicating which row the subject has to recall. A low tone represents the bottom row. A medium tone represents the middle row. And then a high-pitched tone 
represents the top row. All right, so in the center of our screen, you see that there is a matrix. We are gonna take a second to replicate Sperling's experiment. All I need you to do is to stare at that matrix. Roughly two seconds after I say go, I will flash nine letters on the screen. Immediately after those letters disappear, a tone will sound. Use that tone to determine which row to recall. All right, so are we ready? Go. So, did you pick up on that? The high pitch tone sounded, meaning that we recall the top row of letters, which is going to be M, W, H. If you got it, great job. If you didn't, don't worry. For an accurate test of your sensory memory, you would go through this test several times, and chances are you would end up getting the hang of it. Erling found that when letters were projected for at least a third of a second, subjects could recall the sensory information. Once information is in our sensory registry, one of two things can happen. We can disregard the information, or we can give more attention to the information. When we disregard the information, we simply forget it and move on. When we give attention to a certain stimulus, it goes to our next stage of memory, which is going to be our short-term memory. Our short-term memory is going to be a brief storage system that holds items that we are aware of and working with at any given time. These are things that we are consciously aware of and currently thinking about. The magical number seven plus or minus two, some limits on our capacity for processing information, published by George Miller in 1956, is going to be one of the most sourced psychological publications today. Miller's research argues that our short-term memory has the capacity of seven plus or minus two units. So anywhere from five to nine items can be retained within our short-term memory. We are not solely limited to this number, however. Miller found that we have the cognitive ability to chunk information together, or a process known as chunking, in order to retain more information within our short-term memory. Let's try out an example. I am going to display 12 random letters on the screen and give you 10 seconds to study the letter. After the 10 seconds is up, I want you to try and recall as many of those letters as you possibly can. If Miller's research is correct, a majority of us should be somewhere between that five to nine items range. So are we ready? Go. So chances are you had some issues remembering all the letters. So here we have our letters again. Real quick, just see how many you were able to recall. Now we're gonna try this again. This time we're just gonna rearrange these letters a little bit. 10 seconds, here we go. Try it out. Chances are you were able to recall all 12 letters the second time around. Why exactly was the second time so much easier than the first? In our second test, we used chunking. Chunking is going to allow us to retrieve information from our long-term memory in order to provide meaning to newly formed memories, allowing us to retain and pick up on information much easier. When looking at short-term memory, we oftentimes hear this word working memory being thrown in there. Working memory and short-term memory are going to be interchangeable, but for the AP test, there is a distinction between the two. In 1974, psychologist Alan Baddeley theorized the model for working memory. Baddeley's model basically states that our working memory is going to be the temporary storage and active conscious manipulation of information needed for complex cognitive tasks such as learning. Baddeley argued that our short-term memory is for more than just chunking, rehearsing, and the passive storage of information. He argued that we're not only storing information in our short-term memory, but we're manipulating this information as well. Our short-term memory will last about 20 seconds unless that information is rehearsed. Maintenance rehearsal is going to be the simple process of repeating information to ourselves over and over again in order to allow ourselves to keep that information in our short-term memory for longer than that 20-second duration. Maintenance rehearsal is not going to be the most effective method of encoding information into our long-term memory. Once information is properly encoded from short-term memory, 
memory, we arrive to our final destination of long-term memory. Long-term memory is going to refer to the storage of information over an extended period of time. Technically, any information stored in your brain longer than 20 seconds is considered a long-term memory. Theoretically speaking, long-term memory has a limitless capacity and can last forever. For information to be encoded into long-term memory, some type of rehearsal has to be done. We've already talked about the basic act of maintenance rehearsal where we just repeat information. Now we're going to talk about a more detailed form of rehearsal known as elaborative rehearsal or deep processing. Elaborative rehearsal is going to be connecting old memories with new memories in order to form a connection to these memories to try and increase the encoding of this new information. Let's say we're studying for the AP test and we're given a term called the serial position effect. The serial position effect is just going to be our tendency to more easily recall information at the beginning of a list and the end of a list and we'll be more prone to forgetting the information in the center of the list. So I could just keep repeating this definition to myself over and over and over again until I have it hammered into my brain. But psychologists say that this is not an effective way of encoding information. So how can we make it more effective? To to effectively use elaborative rehearsal, you need to associate this new memory with an old memory we already have. So I'll use this example. Let's say I'm trying to remember the term serial position effect. Well, I'm a huge fan of cereal. That's how I can relate it. So what I'm going to do is just picture a cereal aisle with all of the cereals I like. Fruity Pebbles, Cocoa Pebbles, OVOs, Lucky Charms, Crunch Berries. Yeah, all those ones are going to be at the beginning and the end of the aisle while all the center aisle cereal is going to be all that name brand stuff that I never remember and I never even look at because it looks so boring and doesn't even look like it has a taste to it. Well, that's how I'm going to try and form a memory with the cereal position effect. So notice how the position of the cereals are the ones that I remember and the whole definition of cereal position effect is going to be we remember the items at the beginning and the end and not the middle. Theoretically speaking, making those associations will make encoding stronger. So we now know how information gets stored into long-term memory, but what type of information are actually being stored in long-term memory. We have our episodic and semantic memories which are going to be considered declarative memories and we have our procedural memories which will be considered non-declarative. Episodic memories are going to be personally experienced events. These are things such as what you had for breakfast or what you did last year for your birthday. Semantic memories are going to be general factual knowledge. When you're trying to think of a different term for the AP Psych FRQ, that information is being stored semantically. Procedural memories are going to be those that relate to our skills or our habits. Think of typing on a computer or texting on your phone. These are going to be considered procedural memories. You are not necessarily consciously aware of each and every action you are making when you're doing these activities, yet you are still able to do them. I'm sure you guys are experts at typing on your phone. You can probably even send out paragraph messages with very little errors without even looking at your phone. But if I were to ask you to take out a piece of paper and to draw out a keyboard with high accuracy, chances are it would be a very difficult task. Before moving on to forgetting and false memory, just another reminder that this is just going to be a video review. There are a lot of concepts that did not make it onto this video that are still fair game for the AP Psych test. So be sure to dig deeper in those things like how we retrieve memories and how we encode information in a more detailed way. Forgetting is going to be our inability to recall information that we were previously able to recall. Although forgetting can be annoying, it does have its practical values. Think about it, our brain would be filled with tons of pointless and useless information if we remembered every single thing. In the 1870s, German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus is going to study the science behind forgetting. Ebbinghaus's goal was to study how much information was forgotten over a set period of time. However, he wanted to make sure that this information that was being forgot was completely new information. He wanted to make sure there was no pre-existing association. To do this, he carefully noted how long it took him to remember 13 three-letter nonsense words before he could recall the list perfectly. These are things like row or sue, les or cove, just exactly random words. Once he had perfect memorization of these nonsense syllables, he tested his recall at different time periods. These periods ranged from 20 minutes to 31 days. He then plotted his results on what is known now as the famous Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. Well, why exactly do we forget? 
we're going to take a look at two theories. Have you ever had someone introduce themselves to you that only seconds later you just completely forget their name? Why exactly does this happen? Well, chances are you never fully encoded all of this information into your long-term memory in the first place. This is going to be what is known as encoding failure. Encoding failure is just going to be our inability to recall information because we did not encode enough of this information for storage in our long-term memory. The decay theory, on the other hand, will be a biological explanation as to why we forget. The decay theory explains forgetting as a normal metabolic process that occurs in our brain over a period of time. This idea states that when a new memory forms, a metabolic process in the brain occurs. If this memory is not constantly refreshed, it will eventually decay over time. Think of an old billboard you see while you're driving around. All the letters and pictures are going to be faded because of the effects of weathering and the outside environment. The billboard is not refreshed, so it simply starts to decay or fade away. Eventually, it will be completely blank. Kind of like if a memory is not refreshed, it will eventually decay away. We just talked about what happens when we forget, but what exactly happens when we remember something that did not occur in the first place? Elizabeth Loftus is a cognitive psychologist who has dedicated years of research in an attempt to explain why we have false memory. We're going to see that the human brain does not function like a camera. It does not take a perfect snapshot of the world and imprint that into our brain. Over the years, Loftus has come up with several theories explaining the malleability of our memories. The misinformation effect is going to be a memory distortion effect where our existing memories can be altered if we are exposed to misleading information. The misinformation effect can be explained through source confusion, which is when you forget the true source of a memory. So if you have any gaps or holes in your memory, any misinformation provided after the fact can lead to the creation of a false memory. Loftus also explained that false memories can occur just by imagining an event. This is going to be something called imagination inflation. In a classic experiment, Loftus gives participants four detailed accounts of childhood activities that were given to them by relatives or family friends. Three of these childhood memories are going to be actual memories, but the fourth one about being lost in a shopping mall is going to be something that never actually occurred. Participants were asked to study these events in detail and to come back a few weeks later and to report these memories. Loftus found that when we imagine an event, it can increase the likelihood that we believe that event occurred, as several participants actually believed that they were lost in a shopping mall as a child, some even adding extra details to the memory that were not supplied by researchers. Now that we know how we remember information, we can start to talk about how we are actively processing incoming information and how information that is stored interacts with incoming stimuli. In simple terms, Cognition is going to be our mental activities involved in acquiring, retaining, and using knowledge. We are going to start with thinking by talking about problem solving skills. When we are faced with a problem, how do we go about solving it? Psychologists have found three cognitive processes that we use involving heuristics, trial and error, and algorithms in order to solve problems. Trial and error is going to be a problem solving strategy where we just keep on trying different methods to solve our problem. Every time one attempt doesn't work, we disregard that and go to our next until we eventually solve our problem. This can be an effective method of problem solving if the number of possible solutions are low. However, if we have a large amount of possible solutions, it might take a long time to solve our problem. So it might not be the best choice in those situations. Algorithms are going to be a problem solving strategy that follow a specific rule, procedure, or method in order to produce a desired result when used correctly. Heuristics are just going to be following a general rule of thumb in order to reach a desired goal. If I'm in the textbook and I'm looking for information on the nervous system, how do I go about finding it? Well, I don't feel like going through every single page of the book, but you know what? I know that a table of content exists. So I go to the table of content and it tells me which page to go to. That is me using a heuristic or a rule of thumb in order to solve a problem. Even though humans are great problem solvers, there are still obstacles that can hinder problem solving progress. Sometimes we are going to fixate on a certain way of doing things and create a mental set. This is when we focus on solutions that have worked in the past rather than looking at any of the alternative ideas. Fixation can also lead to another obstacle called functional fixedness. Functional fixedness is going to be our tendency to view objects only for their customary use. This is is going to prevent us from seeing all of the options available to us in order to solve a problem. A simple example, let's say something is out of my reach and I really need to get to it and the only thing I have is a chair. Well, 
what does a chair do? You're supposed to sit on a chair, so that's not going to help me. You don't need to sit down anywhere. Well, if someone can't overcome functional fixedness, that is what they would think. But with our ability to overcome functional fixedness, I could say, hey, you know what? I can take that chair normally supposed to sit on, and I can use that as a stool in order to reach the object I need to reach. Like I said, simple example, but I think it helps get the point across. The last obstacle in problem solving that we're going to talk about is going to be something called confirmation bias. This is going to be the idea that people only seek out evidence that confirms their beliefs while disregarding any evidence that goes against their beliefs. Confirmation bias can mislead our problem solving process and prevent us from considering other important options when making decisions. Next we have intelligence. According to psychologists, intelligence is going to be our ability to think rationally, act purposefully, and adapt to our environment. When looking at intelligence in regards to psychology, there are going to be two big questions. How do we measure intelligence? and what is the nature of intelligence. So how exactly do we measure intelligence? What should be included in determining who's a smart person and who's a not so smart person? This has been a debate going back and forth between cognitive scientists for years now. Among some of our well-known cognitive scientists, we have Alfred Binet, David Weschler, and Louis Terman. In the early 1900s, the French government passed a law stating that all French children must attend school. With this new challenge of having to educate all children from a wide variety of intellectual backgrounds, the French government hired Alfred Binet to create an intelligence test. Binet will then go on to establish the first systematic intelligence test. Binet ordered the questions on his test by difficulty. So the harder questions were towards the end of the test while the easier questions were towards the beginning of the test. He found that brighter children performed like older children. What that means is a bright seven-year-old would be a seven-year-old who scores the same as an average nine-year-old. While let's say a less capable seven-year-old may score around the same as an average five-year-old. This is going to give Alfred Binet the idea of a mental age, which is just going to be the measurement of intelligence where the mental level of a child is expressed in terms of the average ability of a given age group. The popularity of Binet's test in the United States led to Stanford psychologist Lewis Terman to revise and develop a new version of the test, which he would refer to as the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. First published in 1916, the Stanford Binet test for many years was the standard of intelligence testing in the United States. The results of Terman's test give an intelligence quotient or IQ, which is going to be a measure of general intelligence, where we're going to compare individual scores with scores of other Others in that age group. While Terman and Binet both believed that intelligence could be equated to one single factor, other psychologists had differing opinions. David Weschler's dissatisfaction with the Stanford Binet test led him to create an intelligence test of his own. Published in 1955, the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale, or WAIS, is going to contain 11 subtests which measure different cognitive abilities. These are going to be things such as our speed of processing, or our verbal score, or our performance score. Weschler thought intelligence was much more than being very smart or not so smart. He believed that there were several factors involved in intelligence. Psychologists today still do not agree on whether or not intelligence is one single mental ability or a combination of several. Charles Spearman is going to believe in general mental capacity. This means that he thinks if you were to do poor on one aspect of an intelligence test, you would do poor on other aspects of an intelligence test. Spearman believes in general intelligence or the G factor. The G factor is basically the level of general intelligence. Someone with a high G factor will be able to perform well on tests that test mental abilities while people with a low G factor will not do as well on tests that test mental ability. Charles Spearman is a huge proponent of IQ being an accurate measurement of intelligence. Psychologists such as Howard Gardner and Robert Sternberg would disagree with Spearman's notion of a general intelligence or G factor. Howard Gardner is going to stretch the definition of intelligence. Instead of analyzing intelligence test results, Gardner is going to look at different skills and products that are valued in different cultures. Gardner's test measured multiple intelligences and measured different learning styles, such as logical, mathematical, bodily kinesthetic, or musical. Very popular in the field of education for over 30 years, recently the learning style theory has come under heavy scrutiny. Nearly all the studies that attempt to provide evidence for learning styles failed to provide e-criteria 
criteria for scientific validity. Robert Sternberg is going to agree with Gardner on the basis that intelligence is more than just what can be reflected in a conventional IQ test. However, he disagreed with Gardner's notion of multiple independent intelligences. Sternberg is going to propose the triarchic theory of intelligence, which states that there are three distinct forms of intelligence. We are going to have analytical intelligence, creative intelligence, and practical intelligence or street smarts. And for our last topic, we have language. Language is just going to be the way that we communicate meaning to ourselves and to others. This can be from spoken language, from written language, or even body language. Our receptive language is going to be our ability to understand language. This is the area of the brain known as Wernicke's area. It is going to be located on the left cerebral cortex right above your left ear. Located a little bit closer to your forehead, we have Broca's area, which is going to be responsible for our productive language, or simply, it's going to be what allows us to speak. In 1967, linguist Eric Lennenberg is going to further popularize Montreal neurologist Wilder Penfield's critical period hypothesis. The critical period hypothesis basically states that if children are not exposed to language by a certain age, they will be unable to acquire proper spoken language and comprehension. A cognitive psychologist and linguist Noam Chomsky will further Lennenberg's research stating that we are born with innate speech enabling structures in the brain that allow us to learn language. This structure is going to be referred to by Chomsky as the language acquisition device. Chomsky determined that language is biologically determined in the human mind and hence making it genetically transmitted. As a result, making language a product of nature and not nurture as psychologists previously theorized. Can language affect our cognition? That is a question Benjamin Worf tasked himself with answering. Worf wanted to know if language did more than just describe a person's cultural background. He argued that language may also shape their thoughts or perceptions through his linguistic relativity hypothesis. Worf's hypothesis is not going to be that apparent to those of us who only speak one language, but to those who speak two dissimilar languages, such as English and Japanese, it is going to become a little more apparent. Unlike English, which has rich vocabulary for self-focused emotions such as anger, Japanese is going to have many words for interpersonal emotions such as sympathy. Research has even shown when taking the same personality test in two different languages, a bilingual individual is capable of being scored with two different personality types. Now on to the FRQ. My goodness, that felt like a sprint. So obviously a lot of information in this chapter. There are some other minor theories and details that I did leave out because like I always say, I cannot fit every single theory and concept into these videos. So make sure you are sticking to those textbook readings. Make sure you're going over the PowerPoints I posted. Make sure you are trying to clear up any misconceptions you may have on things that are confusing you. As always, please email me when you need to. As the old saying goes, I'm gonna make like a tree and get out of here.